Hi, this is Robert Welkner. You're watching CoinOp TV. We are in Manchester, New Hampshire, at the home of Ralph Baer, the uh, father of home video gaming. Ralph, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm here, which is more than some other people my age can say for themselves. We want to thank you so much for letting us come down. Um, if, uh, if you had to sum up uh, some of your great achievements in, uh, in a few sentences, what would you say first off the bat? Well, I've, well first of all, I'd say that uh, video games are a small sector of a 60-year career in electronics, but it turned out to be an important one because I did come up with a concept of playing games on a home television set in 1966 at a time when the TV set was nothing but a passive device. And it started a whole industry, and today that industry is bigger than the movie industry. And what's the game that started off? Well, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the game that started off was a copy of our final prototype, which uh, sh we'll show you uh, shortly, um, and uh, became the Magnavox Odyssey game. It came out in uh, May of 72. I was promptly copied, copied by uh, the people who started Atari and became a Pong arcade game also. Uh, and uh, by 1974, there were already 350,000 Odysseys out there. Mm -hmm. So lots of people were introduced to uh, television home games early on, uh, although most people seem to remember nothing but the old Pong arcade game. We're standing right in sort of an archiving layer of um, artifacts and uh, historic uh, elements to home video game and console. And I have read some of your books, and um, there I noticed there was some of your. Uh, it's it's pretty much your account of uh, with with proof and documents and things like that. Yeah, well, I've always meticulously kept records, so I have the people who work for me, and uh, we kept everything. So there's something like twenty or thirty linear feet of documents. I mean, far more than anybody needs to write anything. Uh, whereas uh, um, we haven't been able to scratch up anything on the history of the arcade games, which is kind of unfortunate because it would be kind of nice to see the thought process on the part, say, of guys like Nolan Bushnell and the guys who worked with him, and it's nothing. Mm -hmm. So what they remember, uh, you can't trust, uh, because you can't trust memory. I know that. I mean, I spent... Uh, several years in court, sometimes for a week at a time, seven hours a day on the stand. And there have been a number of times when in the mornings I swore in a stack of Bibles that my interpretation of some, something I read was correct right in the afternoon. Another paper comes along and says, oh, obviously wrong in the morning. Yeah. So much for memory. Uh, so documents help a lot, and that's why I think uh, people who are really interested in the history of video games and read my book will find it interesting because there's a lot of good stuff uh, that was originated then, preserved, and uh, it's archival in nature, so that you can see what really happened. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely the archiving and the history. Um, I mean, like you said earlier, video gaming is part of our culture, and, yeah, and a big part. Yeah, it's a big part. Why do you think it is so important to our culture? Well, I mean, kids have been weaned on, the, on the, at least the current generation of kids up through twenty or so, up through thirty or so, have been weaned on video games. I mean, who hasn't played video games growing up? Everybody. Everybody, right? When I was speaking with um, Leonard Herman, the, uh, the book publisher, he said that uh, you took sort of a pre-existing gun and put some parts into it. Is that kind of the genesis of how you came apart, building yeah, well, and manufacturing the, the gun? The earliest guns were extremely simple things like, uh, like this, a barrel, a button for a trigger, and uh, you'd point at the screen. And uh, if you were properly lined up, you shoot at the, at the spot, and you make the spot disappear. And then somewhere you push a reset button, like over here, and the spot comes back up. We can do that later on on the on the, on the uh, brown box, okay. the Smithsonian one. So uh, you know, th those guns went f through several uh, iterations. Here's a much later one, which is obviously a little more elaborate. And the one that went with the brown box is not here, but I already showed you this one that went with uh, another brown box to Tokyo earlier, uh, uh, later la earlier last year. And here's the gun that came uh, with the Magnavox Odyssey game of 1972. It was an, an add-on, cost an extra 25 bucks, I think it was. Okay, so uh, in addition to the home console games, um, Ralph is the creator of the classic Simon. What, what year did this come out? Uh, we worked on Simon in about 77, 78. It came out in 79, I believe. So it's been around for you know, 36 years. Mm -hmm. No, not 20, 26 years, I can't add. 
it's yeah. going on the, uh, with the bronze. Uh, what? There was a, a quarter of a century celebration at Hasbro recently, to which they didn't bother to invite me. Oh. <laughs> That's always the way it happens. Right. Uh, of course, si si Simon. Oh, it's on. Excuse me. Just Simon, to yeah, Simon plays uh, the sequence game that virtually half the, half the world's familiar with. Uh, if you had to pick four notes that correspond to those four, um, what four notes would you pick? I mean, that's the question I, I had to answer. Mm -hmm. Well, I went through the encyclopedia that one of my kids had, and I found the one instrument that plays its entire repertoire with four notes, E, C, G, and uh, E, and that's the bugle. You can play taps, reveille, uh, oh. everything with those four notes. Uh, you can play them in any sequence. They never sound raucous. They always sound... Uh, pleasant, yeah, and that's what's in there. So you keep it simple to the bugle notes then? Yeah, yeah, E, C, C G, and E. Has anybody ever called you up and said that uh, the sound's driving crazy or they're having uh, any uh, nightmares or anything? No, uh, the only people who call me say, is, I have a Simon that uh, just took out of the closet that I hadn't seen for 13 years. It doesn't work. Can you fix it? <laughs> okay, so another one of Ralph's creations is the talking speedometer, which we have here. Ralph, tell us about that. Yeah, uh, it's called Bike Max. It was mil made by Milton Bradley. The object was to ha give kids a, uh, a speedometer and an odometer and some other capability that spoke so they didn't have to take their eyes off the road. Um, the unit was supposed to be like this. They decided to make it this big, which is another story. But uh, uh, actually, it turned out to be a really nice product that adults like because it uh, prevents them from having to take their eyes off the road when they look down at a typical speedometer. Mm -hmm. Typically, a speedometer has an LCD display, and to read it, you have to bend down Look at the darn thing. Meanwhile, you're not watching the road, which is bad news. I built a whole series of G.I. Joe figures. Let me see if this guy here still works. Here's a guy with a mine detector. Battery may be low. Yeah, it's, 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 very, it's, it's very, very weak. <laughs> Funky uh, glasses with an earpiece so you can tune in the radio. And these two LEDs on each side flicker with the voice or the music. Wow. Something to wear on the beach, right? <laughs> I don't think I'd suggest driving with that. No, I don't think you should. <laughs> uh, what you're looking at is the original brown box that was the predecessor to the Odyssey uh, home game. Uh, this unit has actually been at the Smithsonian and will be returned there, become a permanent exhibit there. I have it here so I can replicate it. If you look inside, as you're doing right now, you'll see it's full of uh, indiv individual uh, electronic components. There's some 40 transistors, a little black things in here, 40 diodes uh, for some of the logic, and it's battery operated. Uh, it looks nothing like a modern game. Uh, the, the best game, uh, and the one that made it really uh, uh, prominent, uh, was, of course, the ping pong game, which we're going to play on the screen here. There we go. All right, I've been nice to you in balling the ball across straight, right? All right. So, no, but that's no game. The game is oh. that. Thing. Ah, uh, got me on a little hook shot there. That's right. And you can hook here too, but I don't think you'll be able to do it. It takes, <laughs> takes a little practice. There we go. Okay, I'm going to direct it at you for a few shots, but now I'm going to move it around oh. you. Oh. I just went right over you. That's like uh, using the force on uh, yeah. controlling the ball. Well, I mean, it wouldn't be a game if you didn't have uh, some control over the ball. Yeah. In the pong games, remember, the, the paddle is segmented, and if you touch the ball with the upper segment, it goes up. Touch it with the lower segment, it goes down. They chose to do that, and it was easy for them because they had uh, 100 different integrated circuits available in this arcade machine that could afford a $200 Car, printed circuit board, yeah. Whereas this whole thing had to be made for 30 bucks, yeah. Uh, if you want to do that for me with your left okay. hand, and let's see if I can get you, get you well. Uh, All right, here we go. I'm moving it. All right. Yeah. That was too easy. All right, I'm not going to go uh, so easy on you this time. World War two with 18 tons of foreign small arms. I know more about weapons than most anybody else. So okay. I fired a few in my life. Set up three exhibits in three different museums for the military. All right, go a little faster. There they go. All right, good shot. How do you see things going 
in the the next millennium with with uh, games for for people. Well, obviously, uh, because technology is so fantastic today, uh, within another generation or so, which means uh, with the next PS, uh, whatever that uh, that's going to be called, the next PS two coming out, new Xbox, mm -hmm. uh, we're almost there. Maybe one more iteration before. Um, Everything looks photorealistic. What that has to do with gameplay, I don't really know, because we played perfectly fine games with really crude graphics. Yeah. What? Uh, where do things go from now? Just, um, just still inventing and vacation. Yeah, yes, yes, I do. Of course, uh, uh, I'm 83. And my energy is limited. I can't uh, parallel process 16 dozen things anymore, mm -hmm. like I used to. So my working hours during the day are, are a little more circumscribed. But as you've seen before, I'm making uh, replicas and already have replicas out there of the brown box and some other uh, early video game hardware, which is in demand at, uh, by, uh, by uh, museums. As I said earlier, the National Museum, Science Museum in Tokyo has got a brown box. There's one at the Heinz Nixdorf Museum in Germany. There are several here in the United States and in uh, various places. Almost all the hardware that we built back in 66, 67, 68, winding up with a brown box will be at the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. And so will be most of the original documents, all of which we recovered uh, within the last few years, and there's tons of those. Okay, so Ralph, thanks for letting us come down here and visit you in Manchester, New England. Just, uh, just to give the heads up on the book again? The book is called Video Games in the Beginning. And if you look at my website, uh, www.ralphbear.com, that's R-E-L-P-H, B A E R one word uh, dot com. You'll see uh, an ad for it right on the front page. And while you're at it, you might as well look at my website too. Lots of neat pictures are there. All right, very cool. We'll have we'll have people check that out. Well, thanks again. This is Robert Welkner. You're watching CoinOp TV.